Hodgkin lymphoma is a type of uh, blood cancer that um, arises from cells in the lymph nodes that kind of get broken in some ways and, and start growing and dividing more than they're supposed to. It's uh, something that is more of an aggressive type of lymphoma, um, which, which means that it doesn't kind of stay around for years, that usually if you have it, it's going to grow and it's going to present itself before too long highly treatable lymphoma uh, and it's something that is most common in our adolescent young adult years with a peak at around ages in the 30s or so. Hodgkin's lymphoma and, and non-Hodgkin lymphoma are just kind of two different cancers. Um, they arise from different cells. They're both in the lymph nodes. They're both a type of kind of blood cancer, um, but they're just different. Um, there's many, many different types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma from indolent, which means a little bit more slow growing that can be around for years or decades, uh, to more aggressive types of lymphoma that you know you would, you would know you had pretty quickly and could be life-threatening if not addressed quickly. Hodgkin lymphoma is, is just a different type of lymphoma um, than those other groups, uh, arising from a cell within the lymph node that's also a type of uh, B cell. Um, but it's associated with different things, um, uh, different types of genetic changes, and one specifically type of cell, it's called a Reed-Sternberg cell, or it's almost like a, a pathognomonic, or it's, it's what Hodgkin lymphoma is known for. I always tell patients that Hodgkin lymphoma is a very immune, uh, kind of um, immunologic lymphoma, in that it's, it's really, uh, inflammatory and it can lead to a lot of different symptoms because of that. You know, lymphoma grows in our lymph nodes and we have lymph nodes in our neck, in our uh, upper upper chest, we have them really in our elbows, really everywhere. So the first thing that some people find is just they have a lump. Um, you know, have a lump that kind of gets, keeps getting bigger and bigger. Now our lymph nodes get bigger uh, normally at times, so if you get a uh, a virus, if you get some sort of infection, especially in your neck, you can have lymph nodes that get enlarged, or if you get an infection in your skin or cut or something like that, the lymph nodes around that area can get enlarged. Uh, but when it's lymphoma, those areas just don't get smaller. You know, when you get better from your, uh, from your infection, which sometimes could take weeks, but eventually those lymph nodes get smaller. With lymphoma, those lymph nodes kind of continue to get bigger and bigger, and you might have new lymph nodes that pop up elsewhere that also get bigger and bigger. Uh, that's kind of the, the, the run-of-the-mill, straightforward um, type symptom that a lot of people with lymphoma will notice first. But Hodgkin lymphoma, as I mentioned, is really a, a immune-mediated lymphoma. And so the other things that can happen are fevers. Uh, you can have fevers or night sweats where you're actually like soaking the sheets. It's the sweats are so bad and you're needing to change your sheets or change your pajamas. Not just kind of like a little bit sweaty at night, but like really, really sweaty where you're literally having to change your clothes. You're sweating so much at night. Um, some people will get rashes. Some people will get itching kind of out of nowhere. Um, Hodgkin lymphoma can also cause anemia, which is one of your blood cells that is made in your bone marrow um, called your red blood cell. That can be a little bit low and that's really common in Hodgkin lymphoma. And so a lot of non-specific kind of uh, things can happen uh, that, that uh, are related to you know, getting diagnosed or presenting with Hodgkin lymphoma. And that isn't even um, you know, to say that if you have you know, Hodgkin lymphoma in your chest, Sometimes you can have breathing problems or problems with circulation. Depending on where the lymphoma is, you can actually have symptoms from where it shows up that it's causing local kind of irritation or damage to the surrounding tissues from there. Hodgkin lymphoma is really diagnosed by getting tissue. Um, you know, Tissue is the issue, is what a lot of people like to say. So that means doing a biopsy. So in some ways, at some point, you're going to need to take a piece of the lymphoma and look at it under the microscope. And those people who look at it under the microscope are their own very special doctors, because this isn't always something that's easy. You know, you take a look at it and you're like, oh, this is obviously a Hodgkin lymphoma. I already mentioned, you know, there's non-Hodgkin lymphoma and there's a bunch of different types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. There's actually a couple different types of Hodgkin lymphoma. So it's really important that an expert in lymphoma uh, uh, is looking at that, di or that diagnostic specimen. So a pathologist who has experience in lymphoma or has access to people who do is a very important thing because that's how it's diagnosed. 
CT scans, PET scans are common things that can tell us where the lymph nodes are large. They can tell us and give us a general idea if these lymph nodes are concerning for a cancer like lymphoma or if they are more consistent with something like a, you know, infection or something similar to that. But in the end, no matter what, you need a piece of the, the actual lymph node and to look at it under the microscope. And usually that requires either what would be called a core biopsy, so a large needle that is going in and taking a big enough piece of it, or an excisional biopsy, which is some a surgeon physically, you know, basically taking out the entire lymph node, or at least taking out a large piece of the lymph node. Sometimes uh, things are done called a fine needle aspiration, which is basically just taking a very small needle and getting a couple cells. Those aren't adequate to diagnose lymphoma, so, or at least Hodgkin lymphoma, and really any type of lymphoma, they're not ideal. And so uh, in the end, what you're gonna have to undergo if you do have a diagnosis of lymphoma is some sort of either interventional procedure with a core needle biopsy or an excisional procedure with an excisional biopsy or a surgical procedure with an excisional biopsy. The kind of biggest movement in Hodgkin lymphoma has really happened over the last few years, specifically in advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma. You know, there's we kind of divide it up into advanced um, an early stage Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, and that really is, is designed not to scare people because Hodgkin lymphoma is still an incredibly curable cancer. It's one of the most curable cancers that we have. And the vast majority of folks who get diagnosed either with either advanced stage or with early stage are cured of their cancer with the upfront therapy. And so really when we talk about advanced versus early, what we're really looking at is, you know, what type of therapy is going to maximize the chance of curing these folks versus, you know, the side effects of the therapy that we give, because there's side effects to everything we do. There's side effects potentially to taking Tylenol. And um, when you talk about uh, treatments for lymphoma, those side effects can be a little bit higher. So the predominant treatments are chemotherapy and traditionally, and radiation therapy traditionally. And the chemotherapy is given in an IV and it goes kind of all around your body. And, and that's important because even if the, the lymphoma is only in one spot, we think of it still kind of as a blood cancer. You know, it's in the lymph node, but your lymph nodes communicate with your blood system. And so even though it might only be in that one spot, a lot of people think, well, why don't you just cut it out? Um, well, that would work for that one spot, but it's probably elsewhere in a microscopic way. And so using some sort of chemotherapy that gets everywhere is usually needed for patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. Sometimes radiation as therapy is needed if there's one specific spot that needs to be treated. Um, but we're actually trying to move a little bit further away from radiation therapy for a lot of our, our treatments. The big development over the last few years that I mentioned earlier is the incorporation of different types of immunotherapy or targeted therapy into our upfront therapy. So traditionally, we would give, you know, just chemotherapy. ABVD is the combo, which is four different chemotherapy options. And that was really the backbone of what we gave patients in the adult side for many, many years. Um, recently, there's been the development of a couple of different agents. Uh, one um, that's called brintuximab, which targets one of the, uh, the kind of coverings of the lymphoma. It specifically binds right to it, and then it releases chemotherapy basically right into the cell right there. And then immunotherapy, um, which are, you know, pembrolizumab, nivolumab, different types of uh, checkpoint inhibitors is what they're called, immune checkpoint inhibition. And so how those work is uh, th they take the breaks off the immune system. And so our immune system is kind of tasked with two different things. Now, I already told you that Hodgkin's lymphoma is kind of a, a cancer of the immune system. So it's able to evade the other immune system cells um, in, in order to be able to grow and divide and kind of become cancer. And so our immune system has two jobs, as I mentioned, to fight cancer and to protect us against infection. And so when something like Hodgkin lymphoma is able to evade the immune system, it's basically making it so the immune system can't do its job. And how it does that, it basically will have things on the outside of those cells that uh, the cancer cells that tell the immune system that it's safe, it's not supposed to be attacked. Basically, no, don't attack me, let me be, and I'm okay. Whereas 
We want that to be used for, you know, things like our skin and our liver. We don't want our immune system to attack, attack those things. But when cancer uses it to protect itself, that's a problem. And so how these immune checkpoint inhibitors work is they basically take the brakes off the immune system. And so they block that ability of the cancer cell to tell the body's immune system to not attack it. And so by blocking the blocker, we allow our immune system to attack those cancer cells and it works very well in Hodgkin lymphoma. And so currently, in advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma, both brintuximab in combination with chemo and nivolumab in combination with chemo are appropriate um, uh, agents to be used. So we decrease the amount of chemo we give, we add these new agents, and obviously they uh, would have their own set of side effects, but it's different than chemo. So we're hopeful that we minimize the side effects and we also minimize the late effects. So the late toxicity that um, people experience, you know, 10, 20 years down the road. Uh, and that's very, very exciting because it seems like it improves outcomes, it decreases the side effects, and specifically nivolumab or Nevo AVD is a combination that has been recently shown to maybe even be the best, although, you know, it's still pretty early on and there's a couple different options that would still be reasonable. Now in early stage Hodgkin's, radiation and uh, chemotherapy are really the standard of care still. There are some studies looking at these new agents, um, nivolumab and, uh, uh, and brintuximab or, or other types of um, related um, uh, drugs in the early stage period, but those are really being done on clinical trials. So I really encourage people if there's an opportunity to um, take part in one of these clinical trials, you might have access to these um, targeted drugs earlier, and you're also helping the greater society figure out how to use these drugs that are better in the advanced stage period in the early stage period and hopefully cure more people or at least the same amount because we're curing most people of this already but the importantly is decreasing the side effects and decreasing the late effects in the long run. Those agents that I mentioned before and how it works in medicine in general is that usually we pick kind of the hardest to treat population to test new drugs in because we don't want to um, unnecessarily put people who could be cured of their cancer um, more standardly at greater risk by using new drugs that might not be as good as the old drugs. And so these new drugs, the brintuximab, which is again a targeted drug, and the checkpoint inhibitors like nivolumab or pembrolizumab, those have been um, initially studied in those who have become uh, refractory to chemotherapy or standard therapies or have relapsed after said therapy. And so those in combination with some sort of chemotherapy or in combination with each other or in, uh, in combination with some kind of you know lighter chemotherapy are really the standard options and there are so many different ones and we've never studied them against each other and so as long as they're incorporating one of these new drugs and they're doing it in ways that have been established in studies that's really the way that um, that really is the way that um, we, we should treat, you know, relapse or refractory Hodgkin's. Now there is kind of open question that with these new drugs, do we need to do um, what would also be a standard uh, treatment in uh, relapse refractory Hodgkin's, which is called an autologous transplant. Now an autologous transplant is basically taking the stem cells of the patient, the patient who has the lymphoma, collecting them beforehand. So usually what they do is they kind of um, stimulate your immune system after one of the treatment regimens, and then they hook you up to a machine, almost like a dialysis machine, and they kind of siphon off the stem cells from your blood. And so it's not a surgery, it's not like they're doing a bone marrow where they're collecting those stem cells from you and you're put to sleep. It's really just a minor procedure that's done in the outpatient setting um, through veins, effectively. If you have big enough veins, they can do it through IVs, or sometimes they have to use a special special catheter to do it. Um, but what that allows us to do is to give patients higher doses of chemotherapy. So that'd be something that you usually get. You can get it outside the hospital, but a lot of the times people get it inside the hospital. And then they're required to stay in the hospital usually for a week or two, or a couple or a few weeks longer than that, up to you know three, four weeks, depending on how it goes. And, and that's because what, what happens is we're giving you so much um, uh, uh, chemotherapy that um, effectively your body wouldn't recover from it if we didn't give you um, your own stem cells back. And so we give you 
um, your uh, basically we give you a high doses of chemotherapy and then we give you your own stem cells back that kind of um, stimulates recovery faster than it otherwise would be and that's called an autologous transplant now with these new therapies there is some question of do we need to do that for everybody because obviously with these high doses of chemotherapy there's more side effects it requires time in the hospital but really we're not entirely sure who needs that and who doesn't now, there are some people, unfortunately, that even relapse after an autologous transplant. And now for those patients, we even consider something called an allogeneic transplant or an allotransplant. Now that's a type of transplant where instead of taking your own stem cells and giving them back, we take somebody else's stem cells and give them to you. But that's really reserved in the kind of later stages of therapy after you've already had usually these these newer agents that I've mentioned, chemotherapy, a lot of the times radiation therapy, and a lot of the times an autologous transplant. But it's something that can cure a subset of patients with Hodgkin lymphoma that have really been refractory to other therapies. So it's still something that if your doctor talks about and you've been you know treated for a long time, it's a very reasonable option that can that can be really beneficial and, and, and treat the lymphoma in a very um, important way. There's lots of different treatments as far as you know, using these different uh, treatments in different ways, different types of checkpoint inhibitors that are being looked at, and then also even CAR T cells that are being looked at. Now, CAR T cells are chimeric antigen receptor T cells, and basically, in, instead of having you know the the chemotherapy attached to the thing that binds the cancer, so that's uh, brentuximab's way of working, we're actually taking a patient's own cells, these ones that again are supposed to be fighting the cancer, and we're engineering them to kind of target that same thing that the brituximab would, would target, it's called CD30. So some people are also developing CAR T cells that could um, use the patient's own immune system to attack the cancer in a different way. And so there's always new developments that are coming down the pipe, actually even just new different types of ways of using radiation. So using radiation in different ways that can um, still uh, you know attack the cancer, because radiation is a great treatment for lymphoma. but we only wanted to get the lymphoma. And so there's different ways of using radiation that people are researching even that can sometimes be helpful or using it in combination. So there's lots of different things that are coming down the pipe. And a lot of it now is, is currently we have kind of these new drugs is figuring out what combinations, what kind of order should we be using them and how they should be used in general because they do seem to be very efficacious. They do seem to work well and they seem to cause less, less side effects than our, our common chemo. But there's also stuff coming down the pipe because I, I liken it to um, how, I, how I talk to my patients is, you know, how I, and how I think about it in general is that our world is not perfect. You know, I'd like to think that we cure everybody. And, you know, the biggest evidence that our world is not perfect is that, um, you know, patients have cancer to begin with. Ideally, we would be in a world that, you know, people wouldn't be getting cancer or if we knew people who were going to get cancer, we could prevent them from doing so. But that's not the world we live in. And thus, you know, every patient that comes with Hodgkin's, although we cure the vast majority of them, again, our world is not perfect, so we don't cure everybody. And so there's always room to get better. There's always room to advance therapy. And even when we're, uh, even when, you know, if we get to the point, hopefully we do, that we are curing everybody, there's always going to be more research to do to reduce the side effects of that potential cure of that treatment, um, both in the short term and then in the long term, late effects. As I mentioned, a lot of young people get this type of cancer and we want them to live for decades more. And we know that um, young people who have cancer have a lot more uh, medical problems later on, also have a lot more mental health issues later on. So what we can do to, um, you know, to, to address those are areas of, of active research too. And there are treatments and there are different approaches that we're researching to help kind of address those psychosocial needs as well that are really important to, to help our patients not only live longer, but also live better.